here at Full Sail University. How do you feel about that? Wait, wait, before, before you go further, my mother is texting me asking how she can watch this online. Is it really being streamed right now? Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, sorry. I just had to make sure my mom's was up to date on what's going on. <laughs> Should we start again? Again? No, we're fine. Right. We're fine. Yeah, right. Okay, right on! <laughs> All right. I'm here hosting the event called Get Your Foot in the Door, the best film internships and programs, okay? Film programs. So uh, I need you guys' help, helping me welcome our wonderful guests, our panelists here. So first up, we have... 2011 Hall of Famer, director, writer, screenwriter, Darren Lynn Bowsman. Wow. We have second, second assistant director, 2013 Hall of Famer, Larry Katz. And also, this year's Hall of Famer inductee, representing the class of 2014, supervising film editor, Hunter M. Vai. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, so much. So, <laughs> thank you, guys, so much. So, we're a couple, couple months out, right before, right before graduating, right? What were you guys doing to prepare yourselves? Uh, Hunter, for those who don't know, Hunter and I actually graduated at the same time, and we both went to LA. We actually drove to LA together at the same time, and we've been working together on and off since. And I think when we were a few months from graduating, we were planning our first film yeah. uh, out, of, <clears throat> out of Full Sail, uh, an epic opus of, <laughs> uh, called Butterfly Dreams, which is completely unwatchable. But uh, we were, we were convinced it was genius. We thought we were going to get into it Sundance. It was amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my mom couldn't even get through it. She uh, turned it off. <laughs> but I think that's what we were doing uh, the months before going up there, is we were trying to have a calling card that we could go to L.A. with, something that we could show outside of, hey, we went to film school, we went to film school, and then we filmed this. So that's what we were, uh, I think, up to. Uh, I had um, already gravitated towards the AD department, uh, even on uh, in the final film project, and so I had kind of landed on that was what I wanted to do, and I learned about the uh, training program that I'll be talking to you guys about today, called the DGA training program while I was still a student at Full Sail, and I actually, on my own nickel, flew up to Chicago and took the test uh, for admission into that thing while I was still a student. Didn't get in the first try, or the second try, but uh, I was already uh, you know kind of laser focused on what I wanted to do. And then when I did graduate, uh, some of my classmates also put together an unwatchable film, and I uh, AD'd that for yeah. you here in town. <laughs> and right before I left here, I applied for an internship. I remember I called as I was driving cross country for the um, ACE internship, ACE, American Cinema Editors internship. Um, and I didn't hear for like two months or three months once we were already in LA that I was gonna be able to interview for it. But right before I left here, I, I FedExed it out. Awesome, awesome. Cool, cool, good stuff. Um, so what would you recommend students can be doing right now just to prepare themselves? Um, I think that what I would do if I were in your position of going back here is, and uh, I feel bad, because Hunter and I have been talking about this since we've been here, so if this is going to be your answer, I apologize in advance. But I think that it's knowing exactly w what it is your plan is once you leave here. And I think a lot of people still, even, even today, people have come up and said, you know, I haven't figured out what I want to do yet. Well, if you haven't figured out what you want to do yet, <laughs> you, you need to stay in school. And I think that I, my advice would be know exactly what it is you want. Don't have a broad idea. If you want to be a director, then that's what you want to do. And you're, you're leaving here, it should be how am I going to be a director? If you want to be an editor, but know exactly what you want to do and think of it as a roadmap. You're, you're picking your destination. You're not just going to get in your car and drive. It could inform every decision that you make, every type of job you're going to go and get or internship or whatever it is that you're pursuing. <clears throat> everything needs to lead you toward what your end goal is. And when I knew that, like, uh, Darren and I were both talking about this, we were both very lucky. Like, I knew graduating here that I wanted to go into editing. And so I only took jobs that got me next to editors and avids and that kind of stuff. And then at night, you know, cut side projects or whatever. And Darren did the same thing. He got jobs that got him onto sets. And then at night would write or even while well, on that job, he would write. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it, it, it just allows you to, like, to make the decisions are going to have to be made as you go down your career. And if you know exactly what you want, it's just so much easier. 
Uh, I would say, um, you know, people, uh, students ask me all the time, should I move to LA, should I move to Atlanta? You know, I think now as you're, as you're approaching graduation, you need to like figure out where you have resources. Who do you know that you can stay with or crash on their couch? Who do you know that, that already moved to LA two months ago and they're working as a PA and they can help you out? I mean, those are the kind of, uh, you know, people hire who they know. So you need to start figuring out, you know, where, where you have the resources. That, and that should, you know, inform where you want to make your move to. You know, don't just say, I'm gonna go to Atlanta, and if you don't know anybody, it's gonna be a struggle. You need to get, get it lined up ahead of time. Who am I gonna talk to? Who are the people that I can, that I can start asking uh, about helping me when I arrive? But now is the time to start you know, planning that. You don't wait till the last minute. Well, Darren and I, and Rich, uh, our friend of ours, had, we were out one day and we're like, we're gonna move to LA. We made a pact, we're gonna do it. And we finished our movie and we premiered it at a theater and then, and then we left. We went to LA and we didn't yeah. stop. And I had like no money. So if you're gonna do something like that, save some money. Awesome, awesome. So uh, tell us a little bit, we can continue to go down. This is great about your first big gig and how did you get it? Well, I, I think my first um, experience in Hollywood actually started, like Hunter, I started making phone calls uh, before I left here, and one of them, this was back in the day in, 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 of AOL, and AOL had something called Instant Messenger. Okay. And you could search the profiles. This is a true story. I remember you doing this. Yeah, okay. so you had to uh, search, I searched the profiles of AOL, and so how you do that is it would say, enter a city, and I put in Hollywood, California, and then it said put an occupation, and I put producer, and then it would show me a list of 500 people that were online that were producers in Hollywood, and then I would just start instant messaging them. <laughs> and 90% uh, of them were either creeps or wouldn't respond to me, but 10% did respond to me, and it ended up that one of the people that responded to me was the producer of X-Files, and a guy named Harry Bring, and he said, while I was in Full Sail, when you get to LA, here's my number, call me. And so the day I pulled into Los Angeles, I called him, and a week later, I was on the set of X-Files as a PA. Um, and that started just from me being some weird creeper online. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was that. I, I was fired from X-Files shortly thereafter, <laughs> yes. but I did get in the door. <laughs> mm. I mean, also one of the things that I did, though, I knew in there's always somebody, when you're in LA, people say, do you, what, should I move or should I do whatever? Like, I don't want to move out there until I have a job. Well, no one's going to hire you until you are out there because there's 500 other people that are going to apply for that immediately that are already living there. How do they know that you're not going to be there? So one of the things I did is I, and I still have the phone number today, is I got a Los Angeles phone number um, and got a PO box, had no idea. I just knew that 90210 was a nice area or zip code. So I did that and I, I'm, and got a P.O. box, and that way I could put it on my resume that I lived in California, I had a Los Angeles phone number, and, and it just was all ready to go. Um, but my first break was, uh, well, I, I did a couple of things. When I first moved out there, I got a job at a small post house that did uh, high-end commercials, but they went out of business pretty quickly. Uh, my real first break was the ACE internship when I got it, because I can track back every single job that I've ever had to that internship. Um, because I met somebody on that, an editor named Lori Coleman, that brought me on to, who actually edited the original 90210. Uh, but she brought me on to The Shield. And from there, I, every job I've ever done has been based off of that, her being crazy and giving me a chance. Uh, these are, I mean, uh, I want to follow up on what both of these guys said, and you guys should really take it to heart. I mean, first of all, Darren, that is, is be bold. You know, like, don't be afraid to approach people, and don't be afraid to think outside the box to get to people. I mean, don't be a stalker, but for him to just, like, randomly <laughs> reach out to people like that, that's very bold, you know, and that's what you have to do. And, um, and then uh, for Hunter to uh, have thought out, you know, I know that they're not going to hire me if I don't live in L.A., so I'm going to get a phone number. I mean, that's, like, really sound thinking, and that's the way that you guys need to think. Uh, for me, um, I moved out to LA, and you know, like I said, you never know where your first job is going to come from, but it's usually going to be somebody that you know. And so it, it was my stepsisters, former coworkers, ex-boyfriend's roommate, <laughs> that was a personal assistant of um, Jesse Dillon, who was a director, who's a director and one of Bob Dylan's kids. And so my first uh, job was as an office PA on. Um, 2001's finest stoner comedy, How High. So Method Man and Red Man. 
And so, uh, you know, did I want to be uh, an office PA? You know, not really, but as it turned out, it was an awesome opportunity. And what office PAs do is that they do runs and drive around. So once I moved to LA and I was an office PA, that's how I learned my way around LA. And I got to go to every single studio and deliver stuff. And, um, you know, so that was, that was my, first, uh, my first gig, office PA on How High. Awesome, awesome. So uh, let's say, okay, for our directors and writers, right? They're interested in internship. What would be the best route, you think, for them now in today's society? <laughs> I don't think I don't think much has changed from when I left here to now and the fact of getting a job. And I think you got to, you know, some some reality for everyone. When you if, if you want to go to Los Angeles or Atlanta or one of these big markets, you have a million people trying to get that same job that you want. Um, you've never seen more people try to get a free position in your entire life. I mean, they fight, they claw, they beat people up to get that position. And I was one of those people. And I started to realize no one was calling me back. I was not getting any phone calls back. And then I got angry and I just got upset with the whole process and I said, I'm doing something wrong here. And what I was doing wrong was I was trying to get into an industry of being creative, but I wasn't being creative to get in. And so one of the first, I think, real big jobs that I got that I wanted, that I actually maintained, was a, it's a job at a place called Synergy Pictures. Synergy did, um, they did all the diehards, they did Rambo, they did Terminator, they did Stargate, they did Basic Instinct, they did like the biggest of the big action movies in the 80s and 90s. And I found it on a place called Mandy Jobs. Now here's what's crazy about it, and I recommend this to you guys. At that point, it didn't tell me who I was applying for, it says, looking for an office PA, here's a fax number, fax your resume in. Well, 99.9% .9 of the people would fax the resume in and the resumes all looked the same. The resumes were a sheet with their name, their address, and their experience. Well, I had been doing that for over a year and nothing was happening. So I said, I'm gonna be creative. So the first thing I did is I did a reverse number lookup and I found out that that number was owned by Carol Co. Synergy Pictures. And then I took the initiative to call Carol Co. Synergy Pictures and I said, hey, I was just on the phone with Human Resources and I got, uh, I got cut off. And they said, oh, about Mario, the, the Mario Casar assistant position. And so now all of a sudden I, I know Kate's okay, Mario Casar assistant. So I then went on and found out who Mario Casar was. I found out the movies he had done. So now I'm ahead of everyone else on Mandy Jobs that are trying to blindly submit to this thing. So I hired, I spent about $150, and I hired a telegram, a singing telegram, to show up to the place with a, and I've talked about this a lot, with a refrigerator box. So they showed up, and there was a huge four-foot refrigerator box, five-foot refrigerator box, and all that was in it was my resume. And it went directly to Mario Casar. Now, you better believe that that made an impression of the 250 you know, faxes they were getting every afternoon. All of a sudden, some asshole sends a refrigerator box to the place. <laughs> and uh, I got a phone call that the same afternoon I did that. And they, they requested a meeting with me. And the, the meeting was with his executive assistant, not him. And he goes, he was furious that you did it, but he had to see what you look like, so we brought you in here. And I ended up getting that job, and uh, it was one of my favorite jobs in Hollywood. So my thing was, I had to do something different. I wanted to be a director, I wanted to be creative. I needed to be creative in the way that I was actually looking for a job. Now, it's really hard because it's also, there's not a whole lot of like brick and mortar type places to go and actually like drop off a resume and apply. Like the productions, they set up their offices and then they tear them down a few months later, or a year later or whatever, or like, you know, features that shoot around the world will have a production office set up, you know, in LA for a little bit, but then they're going to move and they're all going to move to Philadelphia and then to Turkey or wherever, you know, it, it's, it's, so it's very difficult to actually be able to get in there. And I don't think I ever got a job doing that, doing the, the, cause I remember just scanning like all the postings online and faxing in. And the way that I got the job at the, I took a page out of your book and called uh, this place, cause I, I'd watched Darren uh, push the truth on a couple of things. And I called this place and said, hey, you know, I called you when I was at Full Sail. Um, and you said when I moved out to LA to give you a call <clears throat> and I'm out in LA. That conversation had never happened, and I didn't realize that there was only three people that worked in the place, so the lady knew that I was lying. But I ended up, I went in there and we clicked and they hired me. But like, it's really, really difficult. Finding a way to, to actually speak to a person is what you have to do. Just saying on a resume, I at least have not had any luck with there are no people that really did. I've never gotten a job off a resume, not once. Uh -uh. No, and uh, working uh, in, in a production office, you know, there's the fax just keeps coming and we mm -hmm. have this giant stack of resumes and, and I don't know if anybody's advising you guys that you just need to like fire out resumes randomly, but to be honest with you, I don't know anybody that's ever got hired that way and I've never hired anybody that way. People hire who they know 
And you know, like Darren says, you gotta think outside the box. And I encourage you guys, as you submit your portfolios to my class for Final Film Project, if you're gonna, you know, if you're submitting for, I see all the portfolios look exactly the same. It's a little binder with stuff in it. And it's like, you guys are supposed to be creative, right? So think outside the box. It doesn't have to be that way. You know, why don't you have to do something that grabs the attention. If you don't know somebody there, you have to somehow grab the attention, but it has to be a, a fine line. It can't be obnoxious or ridiculous, you know, or criminal, but you know, it has to be uh, well, <laughs> you have to be, you have to be creative because we're creative. That's why we're here. Right. So I mean, creative. I did something as simple as when I, when I, uh, we had a class here and it was like one of the last classes we took, which was resume and, 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 and they were talking about this, how, how to make yourself stand out. And so I came up with this idea to just a simple resume, cover letter, all that stuff. And, you know, we designed like some, I don't know, like a header or something for it. But I wrapped it and I went to Kinko's and had it bound. And it was blue vellum with like blue paper on the back. And it didn't look like every other resume. And I made sure that it was delivered to the people. <coughs> and I called and said, hey, did you guys actually get my resume? And they said, yes, it's the blue one. It's sitting right on top. And so that simple little thing allowed me to stand out and for them to actually, you know, take a look at it. It's not as cool as a big box. But the, but the fact that he followed up, that's another important point. You know, don't just send it out into the universe. Then if you follow up and say, hey, did you get it? Then, you know, if you don't, it, like I said, people hire who they know. But even if they know about you or know that you're the person that called, you know, it's still, it, you have to follow up. The, the one thing I got off of resume was that internship, which is the one that I called about. That's the one meeting that I got. <clears throat> but it's always about who you know. Awesome, awesome. How do you guys feel about unpaid internships? The reality is it sucks, but the reality is it's absolutely going to happen to you. Um, you know, I think that, again, go back to that thing I just said before this, is you have a million people vying for the same 10 jobs. And so if you're not going to do it for free, someone else would. That said, no one will value you more than you value yourself. So if you, if you allow yourself to be stepped on and walked over, no one's going to come run into your fence and say, oh, we have to pay you money for this. So you have to, it's a fine line. I think you have to get your foot in the door. And once your foot is in the door and you're in the room, you have to start kicking your own doors in and get paid because no one's going to do it. And just make sure you take care of yourself and that you're getting something out of it. If you fight, you get to a point where you're not getting something out of it, then you know it is possible. There are places that will take advantage of you. But my internship was free that I did, and it was six weeks or something, uh, or a month. Um, and 100% worth it. I will say that uh, you guys should Google. There was a, a lawsuit brought by some uh, unpaid intern against uh, Paramount, I think, a couple years ago. And so as far as like studio films, uh, they don't they don't really have unpaid interns anymore. Go you should Google it. I forget the details. Darren Aronofsky's movie, I think uh, Black Swan or something. Swan. So uh, th so now, you know, that there's not really that many unpaid internships on studio features. Uh, so those have kind of gone away. Or know? TV either, because Fox now is, is we, I ended up picking up an intern, because I host interns now. Um, and they found out that they were there and three days into the internship, kicked them out. And they had nowhere to go. So yeah, it's, it's unfortunately a lot more difficult to find the internship with some of the bigger places. Unless they actually, a lot of them also, and it's really worth looking into, they do have formal internship programs directly through Fox or through Warner Brothers, and that would be something to really look into as well. Okay, cool. I know here at Full Sail, we're always talking about networking. How important is networking in this industry? I mean, I think it's everything. I think that um, it's a perfect example. Right now, you're in a, you're in a classroom full of you know, future producers or cinematographers or writers or directors, network right now, too, and find out who you think a great cinematographer is or a great writer or a great producer or actor. And I've stayed with the same people for 15 years now. I mean, Hunter and I went to Los Angeles together, and I still call Hunter and be like, dude, I need your help. Come in and look at this edit. It's, it's, it's horrible. It's blah, blah, blah. And um, the, sa the same group of people that we kind of went to full sale with, we stayed in contact with, and they helped me gain the network. And it's, it's, it is like Facebook. Once I'm in someone else's network, I get all of their contacts and so on and so on. And I think that you need, I'm the most antisocial person I know. I really am. I, I like have a compound and I don't leave it. And <laughs> it's, it's not good because I think that the more you go out and you start talking to people, a job might pop up and they're like, oh yeah, who's that guy I met last night at the bar? Let's call him. Let's see what he's up to. So it's the, the most important thing in filmmaking. I absolutely hate it though. I hate, I hate going out and <clears throat> I just want to like do my job and like get home and now I've got a kid and do that, but it's, you have to do it. You have to get out and constantly be needing, meeting new people. Like there was a story, uh, uh, an editor that was on, oh 
gosh, I, I don't know, I forget what the show was, a long running series, and they were on it for like 10 years or something. And then when the series ended, they hadn't met anyone else. So there was nobody else to hire them because those people had just made a series that ran for 10 years. They weren't, they were looking to retire. And so you can, if you aren't constantly out meeting new people and making new contacts, it is difficult for people to, um, it's, it's difficult to, to keep well, the work going. I, from a filmmaking standpoint as well, is I think that uh, getting cast is, I'm gonna use this as a, to, to use the cast analogy, getting a cast is everything. And a lot of movies don't get financed unless you get a notable cast name. I don't think I've ever gotten a cast member on one of my movies through going through the agent or manager thing. I meet them at parties. And so, for example, I, I was telling a story on the way over here with Hunter. I was at a bar, and Billy Bob Thornton was by himself at the bar. And I walked up to him, and I was like, oh, my God, Billy Bob Thornton. And we started talking, and he gave me his card. And all of a sudden, I had a direct connection to this guy that before I'd have to go 10 steps to get to. And I would say probably my last four movies, all the actors came from relationships that I met at bowling alleys or bars or industry mixers or events. And I think that goes the same way with cinematographers. The, the guy who just shot my last movie um, was a friend of one of my very good friends. And I said, can you put in a good word for me? I never would have got this, this guy if it was not for that. So I think that it's a, it's a way to shortcut and, and circumvent the system the more you network. I'm, uh, I'm not good at networking to meet new people. Uh, I don't like it either. I don't like walking up to people and you know if I don't know them. And so I've, I've always been pretty bad at that. But I will, I will give you guys some tips about nurturing your existing network because it's a freelance world that I'm in and I go from movie to movie and there's people out there that know me and like me but uh, maybe we haven't been in touch and, they, and as soon as I call and say, hey, what's up? They'll be like, oh yeah, I have a job coming up and I could use you. But it's not that they're not thinking about me or they don't like me but you know, maybe we just haven't spoken in a little, in a little while. But I will give you a really uh, important tip about um, you know, uh, nurturing your network as a freelancer. It's really uh, a good move to call people while you're working. Yes. Instead of calling and saying, oh, you know, I'm in between jobs, what are you doing? If you're like, hey, I got three weeks left on this awesome movie I'm working on, I just wanted to check in, maybe we can have lunch when I'm done. It's, it's just a cooler move and it, it, uh, you know, it, it, it's a better move for networking if you check in with people, don't wait until you're in between gigs. While you still have a couple weeks left, start thinking ahead. Who haven't I talked to for a while? Who do I see has something coming up on IMDb? And then, hey, you know, I'm, I have three more weeks on this gig. Let's go for lunch when I'm done. So that's a that's a good move. You guys should write that down. Awesome, awesome. Hmm. Tell us a little bit about your training programs. Any extra training programs that you guys were part of? Well, at I, I think uh, you know the the one. The, internship that I can speak of is the DGA training program and uh, you know I'll, I'm happy to uh, meet with any of you guys you know I'm working here now so if you want to know more about it you know please make an appointment with me find me and I'll be happy to tell you all about it uh, for sure the DGA training program was uh, the major turning point in my whole career you know I like I said I learned about it when I was at Full Sail I applied for it one time as a student I moved out to LA I applied for it a second time and didn't get uh, accepted. You could see my rejection letter uh, on display in the display case in the lobby. And uh, but you know, knowing uh, what a hookup this training program was and what a kind of express elevator to where I wanted to go, uh, you know, I applied for it a third time and was able to get into it. And, and basically, uh, it's 400 days of paid on-the-job training. And there's an administrator of the program that would call me every 50 days and say, "Hey, tomorrow I need you to go report to CSI." And I was the trainee on CSI for 50 days, and I met the ADs and learned their style and worked with the actors and saw that what they were doing. And then at the end of the 50 days, they called and said, okay, you know, tomorrow you're going to go work on uh, Mission Impossible 3. And so then that was my next gig for 50 days. And so, uh, you know, it takes about two years to get through the 400 days, and that was my network that I created. Every 50 days, I met a new group of producers and director and ADs. And to this day, you know, 15 years later, that's my network, and those are the people that hire me, and I've never had to send out a resume, you know, since then. So it's a major, major hookup, and if anybody uh, wants more information on that, trainingplan.org, or, you know, make an appointment with me, and I'll be happy to uh, walk you through it. Do you, do you mean like the ACE internship program that I that's did? That's cool too, yes. Uh, I mean, I, uh, that's cool too. Did you have something else in mind? No, no. Oh, okay. When I, went, when I went through, it was just four weeks, but I met um, the woman that was head of the internship program, and I actually interned in her cutting room, and I uh, edited a scene, and so she came back in and watched it, and, um, and because of that brought me on to The Shield, like I mentioned earlier, but 
a, what ended up happening on that show was um, I met a bunch of different directors, and those directors enjoyed working with me and brought me onto other projects. And I and also a bunch of the writers that were on that show uh, all moved up to producers and then started to have their own shows, and then that kind of turned into you know it's taking it's very similar. It's taking like what was a very small circle and then it expands and then you go on to this next show and the next show has the exact same thing. It's got a bunch of new directors or same directors and it's got a bunch of new writers and then you see it kind of grow and you know it, LA at least when I first moved there seemed very large and very scary and I remember listening to people that had been in a business talk like oh this person used to be there and this used to be there and you know about how it used to be and now I find myself doing it and it's really strange to be like oh I'm now you know an experienced person I have uh, all these different contacts and um, but it's it's starting with something that's very small and allowing it to grow nurturing like you were saying that and I think that's really key Awesome. I was a PA, this is when they were doing free, or an intern at a place called Tapestry Films. After I was fired from X-Files, uh, I, I uh, found this place called Tapestry Films, and um, I was a reader, and so my job was to go through and read scripts and give coverage on the scripts if I thought they were good or bad. And one of the scripts that I, I loved that I read was this thing that ended up getting made called Van Wilder. And uh, what was cool about that was is that, so from as a free position, I was hired as a PA on Van Wilder, to which I was also fired from, but well, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but now, but this is what's really funny though, is we were reading scripts, we didn't even have a place to live. We were living with my friend's uncle in his house and Darren's cat and our friend Rich. And Darren would bring home stacks of scripts. Do you remember this? And you, yeah. we sat down there, we were reading them and you chose to read this like 400 page. And you guys read Van Wilder. His, yeah, and I'm reading, I'm reading Van Wilder just laughing and laughing and the next day you read it and you turned it in and they, yeah. they made it. It's oh, Hollywood's a weird place. I know. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Now, so seeing how your career ha um, has been established now, what's one thing you would change if you could do it all over again? Do you know what I think what it is for me? I mean, I, I don't know. How many in here want to be a, or either a writer or a director? That are, okay. So I think my biggest regret is when I had a hit or when I had something that actually worked, I didn't have something to follow it up with immediately afterwards. So as a writer, I had one great script. And I would go out and I'd sell that one great script and I would have one big opening. And then the, you, you're only hot for a minute because someone else is going to come and push you right out the side. And so, you know, I think that I wish I had multiple things that I set up at one time as opposed to one great. So it's almost having to rebuild yourself every time you do a new movie. Um, so I think having multiple things ready to go at once. So if you do get picked, if someone says, hey, I like that project, let's make it you have something else you can start selling. And it comes to that thing about desperation, about don't call people when you're not working. Desperation's a stinky cologne. Success, though, breeds success. So if you have something and someone's interested in one of your works, try to set up another work right away because you're hot now. You're the new hot ticket in town versus you had, that, you had your moment, a couple months have passed, now you're out there trying to peddle your works again. Someone's coming and replaced you. So I think that my thing is, is, is have multiple things going at once. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, I mean, the biggest thing in Hollywood is always to say, or is, is what's what's next? What are you doing next? Oh, so this is rapping. What's next? And if you don't have a what's next, it's kind of an awkward conversation. I'm trying to think about like a big regret, though. Do you want to? I mean, I've been pretty fortunate, and I was pretty pragmatic coming out of here. And you know, the beginning of my career was uh, was pretty great. I don't have any real complaints about that. I mean, I did have a uh, you know a, a misstep that I can recall as I was coming up, and uh, I talked about it a little bit yesterday in the teamwork uh, panel. But you know, you always need to you know. Be ready to, to know what your boss is doing in case you know you get a battlefield promotion or you need to be called up. You need to be ready to be promoted. And there was a time in my career when I was uh, you know promoted from second second AD to key second, and I thought I was ready, and I was not ready, and it was very embarrassing. And uh, you know, um, I I wish I had been more prepared. It worked it worked out okay, but again, it was it was it was a slip and it was embarrassing. So as you guys are starting in your entry level, you need to already be considering what's the next step and what happens if somebody offers me that. Am I ready? Because you don't want to have to say no, or worse, you don't want to say yes and then flail like I did. I one thing I'll say is is that. Uh, there's not one right way. There's not. And I think that everyone's journey to make it is completely different. 
And whatever advice, I said this last year at Full Sun, I'll say it again, whatever advice that I give right now, throw it out the door when you walk out because it's gonna change. It, it, literally everything changes by the minute in Hollywood. But you know, something that I wish I would have done, and this is gonna sound ridiculous because the book was written 50 or 60 years ago. There's a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. I wish I would have read that before. I, I didn't burn bridges in Hollywood. I threw Molotov cocktails on them. <laughs> and I thought I, was, I thought I was being punk rock. I thought I was being edgy. Fuck you guys, I made Saw too. I mean, that was kind of my... <laughs> and uh, so I was this young... I mean, I, I thought I was a badass. And I said stuff I shouldn't have said, and I did things I shouldn't have done. And then about five, four years ago, three years ago, I, I got the book of How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it's crazy because there, it, it relates to any business you're in. And it's how you interact with people. It's how you talk to people, how you listen to people. How, when you walk into a room, don't pretend like you know everything. Don't say a word. Let them wonder what you actually know as opposed to opening your mouth and making them know you're ignorant. How to interact in social situations. Read that book. Listen to it as an audio book. It takes like three hours to listen to it as an audio book. But it really does uh, kind of pull, flow over into the industry that we're in as well. It could be very helpful. Awesome, awesome. Before we transition over into the Q&A, tell us a little bit about some of the projects you guys are working on now. It, it, it's like uh, being a director is hard because there'll be years where you don't do anything. Literally, I think it was a three year period I didn't do anything. And, and this year I had three movies all get made and I'm in production or post production on three movies. Um, I do this weird, this weird thing called The Devil's Carnival, which is a musical rock opera. I'm doing, I just finished the sequel of that. Um, I just did a, a horror anthology called Tales of Halloween. And then I'm just finishing this movie called Abattoir, which was a, it's like a haunted house, uh, Hellraiser-esque movie that I'm really excited about. That will be my next one that comes in theaters is Abattoir. And that's based off a comic book that you did too. Yeah, I wrote a comic book in 2007, 2007. It took that long to get it, maybe it was 2008. But it took five or six years to get off the ground from a comic book to actually, I shot a concept film, which actually showed here last year, the concept thing, to actually going into actually making it, which we finished production on it uh, in New Orleans this year. Awesome. What about you, Hunter? I finished a show called The Hundred. Uh, just finished doing that. We wrapped, I guess they just aired the finale. And then I'm on a new show called Damien, which is about... Um, uh, it's based off the 1976 film *The Omen*. It's about the boy when he's grown up. And then, you know, I don't know what the next. Uh, I guess I'll go. Tell, you say what? You're, what you're possibly doing? We're going back to the hundred and possibly directing an episode. Directing an yeah. episode, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So we'll see. Wow. <laughs> now I have to do it. Yeah. You're gonna be an asshole. Me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lucky guy. I produced uh, two short films this month, one called Saving Miles and one called Shopping. Uh, last month, I produced three short films called Ashore and uh, The Doll That Aged and Telepathia. And uh, that's me working here at the school, having a lot of fun. Um, but uh, I, will, I do have uh, still lots of friends in LA and lots of uh, connections and people that I would like to work with. So um, if I have to uh, take my leave of you guys for just a little while, you'll have to excuse me. You know, I've got to put a couple of jingle jangles in my pocket and, uh, you know, stretch those muscles out a little bit. So, uh, you know, there's always a couple irons in the fire back in LA. So um, I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, to get back out there for a little while too. Cool, cool. So now we're gonna transition over to the Q&A. If you do have a question, raise your hand and a microphone will come your way. If you're online, um, please um, refer your question to our online moderator and they will try to refer it back over to us. Okay, everybody cool? All right, so we will start the Q&A. Um, I don't know how to say this, but what is your advice for um, aspiring female directors that's come out of film school? Say that again, the advice for what? I'm sorry. What is your uh, advice for aspiring female directors? Female directors. Um, I just want to make sure, I, I, advice for female directors? Um, Go fucking make a movie. I mean, I, I don't look at, uh, it, listen, a, a good movie is a good movie. And I think whether you're white, black, male, female, um, I think do, do what you know. Do, do a story that's personal to you. The one that I give, uh, my advice goes the same from, from anyone, no matter who you are, where you're from. Tell a story that only you can tell. If someone else can tell the story, walk away from it because you shouldn't do it. Find something that is wholly personal and original to you. And I think that, um, I choose weird movies. I do weird stuff from, from you know, d 
doing rock operas to doing like, I went from a rock opera to a crime thriller to now I'm doing a sci-fi thing and things that are, I don't want to pigeonhole myself. I want to do things that only I feel I can make. So I think do something that's personal to you. Something that again is a story you have to tell and you want to tell. Um, that's, that, that would be my advice. Hunter? Yeah, no, go, just go do it. I mean, I don't, I don't think that there's a differentiation between um, male or female at all. I think it's just getting out there and doing it. Yeah, I think um, one of the big things, there, there are two types of people in Hollywood, in my opinion. People that talk about making movies and people that make movies. And um, so I, again, I, I repeat myself a lot in things I say, but I really hold these to be truths, <clears throat> is that I am not a talented filmmaker. I'm below mediocre. The difference is I do. If I say I'm going to do something, I go off and do it. People that are a lot more talented than I am, people that I went to film school that are better directors, better artists than myself, uh, they ended up giving up. Not because they weren't better than me. They were better than me. They just didn't go do it. They just talked about doing it a lot. So don't talk. Just go do. I will say, you know, statistically speaking, uh, you know, uh, there are way fewer women directors than men directors. Obviously, it's not up to the three of us at this table. I, I don't see gender. I see good directors and artists. Uh, but it is uh, kind of an old boys club in Hollywood, and it's unfortunate. And uh, people talk about all the time how to change that. But um, just, you know, st statistically speaking, that's what it is. Hopefully it will change. But if you're passionate and you have a story to tell, then, you know, go make art. I would use it to your advantage because I think there are some initiatives, there are some programs that actually are designed just to off balance that. Like I know that AFI has a program called the Directing Workshop for Women that, yeah. I've, that I've worked on and <clears throat> I actually edited one of the things. And it's an amazing program. Um, so, you know, take, take advantage of that if, if that's available. One thing that I'll, I'll say as well is that Hollywood is such a, it's, a, it's such a small circle of people. It seems big when you first get there, but in reality, pretty much, it's a small town. Everyone knows everyone. And there are a lot of these things that are um, not only, uh, as he just mentioned, but there are workshops for, for female directors, but they, they actually band together and do things. There's a, a new horror anthology coming out of only women directors. So they do, I mean, if, once you get to wherever you're going, I'm sure if you do some research, you're gonna find that there are communities that just basically further and uh, help that, but good luck. Awesome. Hello, uh, my name is Mike McLaughlin, and uh, I wanna know, so it seems like you guys all have had your trials and tribulations, you've had successes and failures, so once you get your foot in the door, how do you keep your foot in the door? Best advice you can give without being a kiss ass and being able to maintain your dignity? Um, provide a service that they need. Um, and do something, again, that you, you just got to always, the mentality that I go into everything with is, is that there's a million people that want my job. And what am I going to do to make my, myself be relevant? And that is, you just got to always think that make yourself uh, an absolutely important cog in the wheel. If, if they can function without you for a week, you're going to get fired. And you have to make yourself critical to what you're doing. So once your foot's in the door, just be good at your job. Um, and, and again, something I've learned in my filmmaking career, which I wish I would have known earlier, is be cool to be around. Be fun to be around. And I think that um, there was a time in my career that I was angry. I was bitter all the time. I was, I was an asshole. And no one wants to be around that. It's just not cool. Um, and I think that filmmaking should be fun. We're lucky. We get to create worlds. We get to create characters and universes. And we get to hang out on sets and, you know, with, with these, like, bigger-than-life celebrities. It should be fun. So be fun. Like, and realize the, the, the kind of gift that we've been given to basically play and make-believe. And I think that um, never lose sight of really where you are. I think, I think being pleasant to be around is a hugely important thing and being able to deal with all kinds of different people and knowing, <clears throat> you know, knowing when it's okay to express your opinion and when it's not uh, is something that's really important. And, but on a more pragmatic level, one thing that I try to do is to always learn something new, learn something new from each director that I work with or learn something new from each project that I do or maybe it's I learn you know, a, a new shortcut on the Avid, whatever it is. Always try to be learning something or cut a scene a different way than I would ever cut it. Like, you know, I, I did the um, show Mob City and we had this, uh, a bunch of people, were, the hero characters were in the room and I'd cut the scene straight, the very normal way. And then I was like, what if I told it from this other person's point of view that's, you know, be, uh, you're not the main storyline. And it was a fascinating exercise and that ended up being what we went with. 
And it was just something, you know, I could have cut it straight and normally and done it like that, but I challenged myself to look at it from another perspective. So whatever the field is that you go into, I think that the same idea applies, which is always be challenging yourself to improve and to get better, and that will make it so that you are, like Darren was saying, somebody that they can't go without a week with, you know? These guys touched on something very important, uh, you know, especially on set. We're talking about, you know, 15, 16 hour days. And, you know, I want, if I'm going to be hanging out with people for 15 or 16 hours, they have to be people that, you know, you want to be around. And, you know, I touch on this on every full sale panel, but that uh, relates to personal hygiene as well. Not to say that all full sale students have that issue, but certainly there seems to be some kind of a funky uh, aroma sometimes. And, you know, if we're working together for 18 hours and I can't get within two and a half feet of you. I bring deodorant everywhere I go because it's not cool to smell bad on set. It's just not cool. It's just don't do it, please. So, so yes, I make, make, cutting room. Yeah. make yourself somebody that people want to be around. Another, uh, once don't be get, the stinky guy on set or, or lady on set. Once you get your foot in the door though, I think, and I was just having this conversation today with uh, Matthew Dunn, who's the first AD that I usually work with. Uh, and I asked him that same question and he said consistency. So if you, you got your foot in the door because you're great and you're the one that got that job. So you can't just be great on like day one through nine. You set that bar and you have to be consistently great all the time, on time, ready to go, nice to be around, nice smelling all the time. And as soon as that consistency starts to go away, you know, like Darren said, there's a hundred thousand people at home on the couch looking at their phone, waiting for it to ring that can be there in 10 minutes. So consistency is the way to keep your foot in the door. You know, when you get in, because I uh, was lucky enough to get onto this, the, the show that, and, uh, that I should not have been on, been on at all, <clears throat> and I was constantly challenged because I was not ready to, for the, to get the bump up. And I was like, I mean, I'm very serious. I was, I was ill every morning. I was vomiting. I was so nervous thinking they're going to fire me. And I'm like, they're totally, I, there's no way I'm going to make it through this. And I was like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit before they fire me because that's just going to be too much. And then I got my first check, and I was a union check, and I was like, I'm hanging out here <laughs> until they fire me. I can do this. And then, um, and then everybody in the editorial staff ended up leaving for different reasons throughout that season. I was the only one left. And one of the producers comes in and says, you know, I just want you to know, you should not leave. You should stick around. Like, even the fry cook gets bumped up something. I forget exactly what, it's, what the saying was. And he was basically like, you should stick around. I see good things coming for you. And... At the end of the season, this other person comes up and says, hey, I want to thank you for always being so calm. You were the calm amongst the storm. And I was like, I was the one that was literally vomiting in the bathroom downstairs because I was so nervous that this wasn't going to work. And then that was the first season. The third season, I was cutting uh, uh, you know, on the side doing projects, and I got a call. And it was executive producers. And they said, we're looking to, for, to, to move you up to editor. And what I did, because I knew that I didn't have the experience under, under me to, to take this on, was I worked every Saturday for free. I worked every Sunday for free. I stayed late. I did not, because I, I knew that they could have hired somebody else that was way more experienced than I was. So I wanted it to be as easy on them as possible as if they had hired somebody that was more experienced. So I gave all this free time in order to get faster and to keep up so that it didn't, I didn't become a liability for them. Um, and I think that sometimes that gets missed by people that, that I've been with that I've watched get bumped up is there, you know, they could, well, I'm gonna work my 60 hour week or whatever and then go home. And sometimes you just can't do that. Uh, one of my favorite expressions, uh, and to go along with what Hunter said, and, 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 and it goes along with, you know, being somebody that people wanna be around and he's calm. They, they perceive him as calm. So one of my favorite expressions is to be a duck, be like a duck. So if you look at a duck on a lake, on the top of the water, that duck is mm -hmm. like very serene. But underneath that water, those legs are pumping away. So Hunter, every morning, is vomiting and, you know, having explosive diarrhea all over how, his apartment. I didn't say that, but how did you know? That's uh, actually real. That's too <laughs> I thought that was probably what was happening. <laughs> but, but yet, he's perceived as the calm guy on, at work, and so they want to keep him around. So, you know, be, be like a duck. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Alex. I'm over here. Right here. It's very hard. Oh, yeah, I guess yeah. Um, I just had a question about uh, students who are kind of new in the program. I'm only in month six. Uh, what do you recommend I start to do to push towards my career, or is there anything that I can do now, you know, throughout my full sale career that will help once I get out? Um, you know, when we when we went to full sale, this was Hunter and I graduated 15 years ago, but it, it's. It's crazy. I think you're, you're going to get what you put in to everything in life, including full sale. And so there was a group of us, maybe five or six of us in our class, that we were here every day 
even on our off days, even when we didn't have labs, we were here and we were constantly talking to the instructors and we were checking out gear and we were trying to basically uh, consider this a sacrifice of our time in life. We weren't going to parties, we weren't going to all the bars, we were only focused on what's next. And I think that, that it's, you get what you put into it. And I think now, 15 years later, the same people that did that are still working in Hollywood and in the industry that we chose. So I think that for you, I don't know what you're, what, what, are, you, what are you here for? Yeah. What in film, though? What yeah. Okay, then you should be producing every single day. Like, seriously, and that, that could be a 30-second spot. I mean, we were joking last night that when we were here, we, uh, we directed and edited and produced, like, oh. some of the worst, like a, <laughs> like a golf, like a backyard golf putting green uh -huh. and just horrible things. But we were constantly working and we were constantly on set. And I think do that. Get, produce, literally, produce a one-minute short film. And then the next week, produce a 10-minute short film. You start your network. Start meeting with writers and directors here. Because if you want to be a producer, you need content. I'm sure there are writers here in this room. Go start talking to them. Network with them. Find something that you like. Find your voice and their material and get it made. Start doing that and get in a routine of doing that. Because what's going to happen is you're going to leave full sale and you're going to get dropped into the world. You need a routine. You need to know. So if you're going to do that here, you can do it anywhere. So my advice for you right now is, is pretend that you weren't at full sale right now. Literally, live each day as if you're in the, in the, in the real world. So, so start producing right now. You don't need an I mean, excuse to produce. Full sale is an amazing place with amazing resources. And like, I, I mean, when, when we came here, you know, forever ago, I mean, it's fantastically better now than it was then. Um, but even then, like, I, I came here because they had more avids than any other school does. I was doing research in these other schools and the biggest complaint was that you never got time on the machines. And well, I came here and we had all the time we wanted on the machines. And then they had, like, I was TAing our own avid class is, is my memory of it. Like, and I was in the lab until like four in the morning just because that allowed me, by doing that, that allowed me to stay in there later working on golf videos or whatever we were making at the time. And like, I could work on my own projects in there and um, just really, I mean, yes, it's college and it's fun, and we did go to parties and drink, Darren. And we oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but we also took it extraordinarily seriously because we, we really knew that we wanted to do this, and it really is a very, very competitive business, and it's very challenging. And, I mean, it's, it's here. It's, it's all here. Go, go. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason not to. I would, uh, I would add, you know, um, in my class, Final Film Project, every month we produce a short film, and uh, every month I hear from a very small group of go-getter students that uh, contact me and volunteer to work on those films, and they, we always need production assistants and extras, and I mean, uh, you know, you guys are talented, and you guys are getting an amazing education, but what you do not have is experience on set, and there's no shortcut for that, there's no class for that. And even if you want to be a producer, you know, I agree with Darren, you know, you've got to be what you want to do. But you still, you don't think that a producer should know how long it takes to set up a C-stand and put a flag on it? Like, you don't think that would be important information for you to have? So, I mean, you guys need reps on set to get, even if you want to be a producer and you're never going to be on set, you need to know what that's about. And that, that is available to you here. And, you know, I make sure that these sets are very similar, just a small microcosm of what a real set is. And so please contact me and I'll be happy to get you in, uh, in contact with the ADs and the UPMs on the, the student films and get time on set. Yeah, we did that. I came and we would follow, for some reason it was somehow tied to my editing class, but we would come and hang out with the, I was with the classes that were behind us on their 16 projects. Yep. It was great. And even if you're a PA, if you're a door PA, I mean, any minute that you are on set is valuable because you guys, again, you're going to leave here with education and talent and you know creativity, but you don't have experience. And so you need to realize that, you know, once you get in the real world, that you're going to be dealing with every single person has more experience than you, even if they didn't go to film school. You know, they're still on set, even if they have one day more of experience than you do. You have to be, you know, kind of reverential to that and understand what your standing is. But I'm giving you the opportunity to get reps on set, and that's, uh, I think, what you guys all need. I want to go back to one thing that Darren said, which I don't think it really relates. I was just thinking about it. You were saying that in the uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? It said just to keep your mouth shut. Yep. Keeping your mouth shut is so incredibly important, especially when you don't know what's going on. Nobody in the room doesn't know that you don't know what's going on. If everybody else in the room knows what's going on, they're going to assume that you do too. Be quiet. 
get out of the meeting somehow or the room or whatever it is and call somebody or look it up or whatever that does know how like what's going on that's a hugely important thing and Tony that book is it changed my life when I when I read it and it's uh, again how much it's actually related to the, my filmmaking career in the last few years so definitely check it out it, it's a complaint that I hear from people in the industry about full sale grads that you know you guys get out there and oh I was the director on my final film for four days so I know something you don't I mean again you're getting a great education we all got educated here and had successful careers but there is no shortcut for experience, so keep your mouth shut until you've done it 500 times, and then you know what you're doing. Until then, you're still learning. But I, st I mean, I, I would say I still don't know. Like, we, you have to every time you go and do it. It's a new circumstance. It's a new situation, and and I still, I'm not, maybe I don't vomit every day, but I still get very nervous going in and doing it because it's like. These people think I know what I'm doing. But, well, yeah, but right. once, once you get experience, you can fake it better. Right, you do fake it better. You do, and you can sleep better at night. I That's, fake, yes, we all I've fake made it. an entire career faking it. <laughs> <laughs> we all fake it, and, you know, I would I would, uh, I would, would be on set and, you know, give it, be on bigger and bigger movies and very concerned that, you know, I didn't really have a good handle on it. And I looked around, you know, and I kind of realized that everybody is kind of faking it. You know, once you've seen everything once on set, you can react better, but still, you know, everyone is kind of faking it. So just keep your mouth shut. Don't, you know, be a duck. Don't let them know that you're vomiting and uh, and fake it. The explosive diarrhea too. Explosive. Yeah. Hi, my name is James. Um, I want to be an editor when I get out of full sale. So my question is, do you know of any uh, internships through any companies that are very worthwhile pursuing. Well, I highly recommend the ACE out. internship that, that I did. That's an amazing program. And they, I would love for somebody from Full Sail to get in there because they're always asking me, where's your fellow Full Sail people? And any time I get a chance to talk about it, I say, please apply for it, go for it. It's an amazing program. Um, but also, I know that Fox has a, a post-production internship because we ended up hiring that intern to be our assistant on Sons of Anarchy. Um, he was supposed to like move on, and I know we keep talking about like going and meeting new people, but he was with us for like a week, and we just really clicked. And he was supposed to go and meet like three other rooms, and he gave up the three other cutting rooms and stayed with us for a whole month of that internship, and then um, it worked out for him because we ended up hiring him um, for like two or three years. We, we worked together, um, but I would look into the individual studios, and I would 100% go after that ACE internship. Mm. Um, yeah. Wow, that sounds really weird. Uh, what, uh, well, in your opinion, how far does uh, international experience uh, go for in the in Hollywood or United States uh, industry? Because oh, my experience is obviously overseas, so just does that count for much here, or does they hire like locally American trained people? I mean, you know, your your immigration status can certainly have an effect on your hireability. You know, you're not going to get a visa to be a PA probably, but you know, if you're if you're uh, if you're, you know, if your immigration is good and work in this country and you're talented and you have experience, then yeah, I mean, that's definitely a good thing. I mean, it can certainly be something that makes you unique, also, and then lean on that if that's something that I mean, find the job that where that specialty goes for that. I. I I have a friend who, she was my assistant on a show, she ended up, uh, she's now on Blacklist, she just cut an episode of Blacklist. But she was uh, an American that lived in Italy for like 12 years or 15 years, the majority of her experience was, was uh, in Italy. And I know that it, it was a transition for her to come back here, not because it was Italy versus the United States, but because she didn't have the contact. She had been gone for, for so long that it was difficult for her to find her way back in. She was very skilled, and she happened to have a friend uh, who was the other editor on the show, and that kind of got her. She's starting to get enough credits now, but there was a little bit of uh, of an issue for her, and she's the breadwinner for their family, so it was very difficult on them for a little while. Um, but it can also be an advantage instead of a disadvantage. Online. Sure. Uh, there's actually quite a few questions this time. Uh, a lot of them are for Hunter, but I'm going to start with, uh, they're asking, uh, several people are asking about scripts. How do they get their scripts in front of someone? Is it best to move if they live in Nashville, Tennessee? Do they need to move to California or what's the best way? I mean, I think California always helps in the way that, um, 
Listen, I mean, we live in a digital age. I don't think I've seen my agents or managers in years. I get Skype calls, it's telephones, it's texts. That said, going to these industry mixers, like it was crazy. I went to a, an industry mixer right before I came to get a full sale this time. And it's insane. Like it's, it's, it's actors that you've seen on TV. It's filmmakers that you watch all the time. It's producers. And um, deals are done in back rooms. I mean, that's, you know, you always hear that thing and it's, they're done in bars, they're done in whatever. Like you and I should make a movie. Yeah, we should ask him to be in it. So I don't read unsolicited material. For example, I've had a lot of people try to send me scripts. I don't, I don't do that. And so you have to find a, a way to circumvent that process. I will read scripts from my friends or people that I have connections with and connections through. So I think you're in a weird catch 22. Either you have to show me something that you've done, like it's been produced, like, hey, take a look at my short film. I'll watch your short film, but I'm not gonna read your script. Or I have to know you or know someone who knows you. So I, I think, do you have to live in LA? No, not necessarily. But you just have, I think, a longer journey to get that material read. So it goes the same way with agents and managers. They're not going to really look at an unsolicited material. Um, at least that's my my experience of it. Well, I think one thing that that is very difficult, and, and Darren, you know, you shopped your script all over the place, right? And and were like fighting to get people to read it before it finally was was taken in. But people, I don't, I don't think, fully comprehend that like reading a script is an hour to an hour and a half commitment of time. Two I'm a slow a, reader, so I'm longer. I'm like three hours. That's why I don't read <laughs> stuff. I just and so it. it's a very big, it, it really is a commitment of time when you already have all of that to do from other people that you know, let alone somebody that you don't know. There's always your next project or like a friend's project or, hey, can you read this and give me notes? There's always something going on. Um, and so when it's an unsolicited script that comes in, it's, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it, it's going to go to the bottom of the pile. I get frustrated very easily when I read scripts, and I think that I encourage everyone to, that, that wants to be a screenwriter, to research, read other people's material, read um, as, as many books on it as you can. Um, say, what is it, Save the Cat, is that the name of the, the thing? But I've read all of that. I mean, you need, I'll make it five pages in most people's script before I put it down and get a migraine, because it is, it takes, it takes me three hours to read something. Yeah, I'm very slow. And um, so because of that, it, it, screenwriting is a really hard thing to break into if you are, again, just coming up. I mean, Hunter's right, I started as a screenwriter, I didn't start as a director, I wanted to be a writer. And um, I went around Hollywood trying to sell this script that no one would read, I couldn't get anyone to read it. And I thought it was good. My friends thought you it was good. You even changed the title. I changed. So I thought that it was a conspiracy against me. So I changed the title and put someone else's name on it. And eventually, this is not an exaggeration. I, f I f fake it till you make it. I made f a fake management company up and wrote fake coverage on it and put it in the studio system under a fake name and to create hype on it. Like I couldn't get anyone to read my stuff. So I had to figure out a creative way. Again, I told you, be creative in what you're doing to actually sell my first script. Now, when I sold the first script, then anyone would read it. But it's, it is a challenge. I have to get these guys to another panel, unfortunately. So um, we have to, I guess, end here. Any uh, last minute statements you guys want to make before we uh, close out? You guys are in the best position you guys possibly can be in right now. And you've taken the initiative in your career already to be in the best environment to, to basically make it. Uh, and again, it, it's all about what you do right now, how seriously you take where you are right now based on, I think, where you're going to end up. That's my, my advice. So it's all what you're going to put into it from this point forward. I feel like there was a lot of, uh, I don't know if it's true, but I feel like some of the conversation at least was negative. And just so you know, it's totally worthwhile. It's a fantastic business. It's always fun. It's always challenging. It's really cool to be able to create something and be a part of something, um, whether people but it's really nice when people watch it. But to know that you've been a part of creating something that's actually out there. Um, so while it is brutal and hard and difficult and expensive in LA and New York and whatever, um, it's also a lot of fun. It really is. Just uh, bear down. I mean, you guys are getting ready to graduate and the hard work then starts. It wasn't, you know, school wasn't the hard part. You know, coming here, taking initiative, following your passion, awesome. But now it's time to bear down. It's going to be, it's going to get harder before you know you have success and uh, you got to get through that but you know if you're passionate then it's uh, it's a labor of love and you know every uh, 18 hour day I have enjoyed well most of them um, <laughs> uh, because it is you know it's a really really fun job to be able to wake up every day it doesn't feel like work you know going to make movies it's like you know uh, unbelievable but 
You have a lot of hard work coming up. You my guys can do it. My last thing I want to say, and again, kind of echoing Hunter's thing about, about positivity, I think one of the biggest things, my biggest selling point as a director, and I, I encourage everyone as this as well, is confidence in yourself. Believe in what you're doing. Believe in yourself, because no one's going to believe harder than you, and you have to be your own best salesperson. So the person that, that wants to sell a script, um, it's all about confidence. It's all about, again, selling and learning how to sell yourself. And there's not one right way that I've found. It's whatever way works best for you. It's the duck. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So, uh, guys, thank you so much. And you guys are in an awesome place to make it happen. <laughs>